I too want to welcome everybody today on this very frigid Valentine's Day. If you're watching from Florida or Texas, congratulations. I know that uh, it's cold in both of those areas. It's probably below 50. Um, my heart just breaks for you. That's all I got to say. Okay, my, my heart just breaks. So um, good to have you with us today. Thank you uh, for those who, who are here. And I want to start today by showing you a sequence of numbers, okay? And uh, what I want you to do, whether you're at home or in the audience, if you know what it's called, I want you to raise your hand and say, oh, I know, I know, I know, okay? And uh, if you're at home, I'll call on you, okay? Here's a sequence of numbers, okay? 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55, 89, 144, 233, and 377. Okay, two educators know anybody else? Okay, so, a director of a, a crisis pregnancy center knows. Anybody else knows what this sequence of numbers is? Okay, it's called the Fibonacci sequence. Okay, and this is how it works. Okay, go to the third number and then go back the two numbers before that and add them together. And it just keeps adding up. Okay, for instance, zero plus one is zero. One plus one is two. Two plus one is three. Three plus two is five. Huh? Okay, I stand corrected by my wife, the teacher. Um, zero plus one is one. And uh, is that okay? Okay, then the sequence is okay otherwise. Okay, great, great. Um, so the Fibonacci sequence is found repeatedly in nature, okay? In such things as, say, pine cones, pineapples, and daisies. I don't know if you knew that or not, okay? I just want to, express, I just want to expand your knowledge base here, okay, today. And uh, one of these has relevance, especially for today, okay, at least in my mind. Out of those three, it's the daisy, okay? How do daisies and February 14th go together? Well, it's Valentine's Day. And it's that day when we profess or at least share cards that share our love for those who are closest to us. But you know what? There are some who may doubt whether or not anybody really loves them. So what do they do? For centuries, people have taken a daisy and they pluck a petal and they say what? She loves me. She loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. And whatever that last petal, the phrase you said, then that's the answer to the question. Okay? Now, um... What I learned was that this problem-solving method, okay, really goes back to the 1800s in France. And the connection between the daisy and the Fibonacci sequence is this. The typical number of petals on a daisy is one of the numbers of the Fibonacci sequence. Depending on the size of the daisy, there's probably either 13, 21, 34, 55, or 89 petals. Now, how fantastic is that, okay? You may not remember anything I say about 1 John today, but hopefully you'll remember how many petals, okay, are on a daisy. Now, I'm not going to ask anybody to admit if they've ever used this song and this methodology to determine whether or not somebody really loved them. But my guess is we've probably used something similar, okay, to the Fibonacci sequence somehow to answer some questions about love in our lives. Today is Valentine's Day. It's that day when the word love is probably going to be used than, many other, than any other day of the year. But we really can't ignore the fact that there are going to be some people who want to hear it, but won't. Especially this year, as more and more people are living with feelings of isolation and being all alone, what they really want to hear from someone are those words, I love you. You know what? We begin to think that when we're all alone, that no one loves us. But it's today as we continue our short series through the book of 1 John that's simply entitled Confidence in a World Filled with Questions. I, I think what I want to suggest to you today is that sometimes the questions that we hear come from inside our heads and not from someone else. And the fact that we are looking at a book that was written by a man who described himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved, I think really adds validity to the point that 1 John is a great place for us to find who loves us. You see, John knew what it meant to be loved by God. 
Because he had experienced that firsthand in his relationship with Jesus. So today, as we celebrate a day of love, if there's anyone who ever questions whether or not they are loved by anyone, my hope by the end of this message is, beyond a shadow of a doubt, you will know that you are loved. If by nobody else, God has poured out his love for you. Now, as we continue our walk through 1 John, I'm not going to go from left to right today. I'm going to cut somewhat jump around in, in some of the chapters. And I won't even talk about all of the passages that talk about God's love. But I want to try to highlight some that I think give the strongest defense of how God loves us. Let's begin in 1 John chapter 4 at the end of verse 8, okay? With three simple words that John tells us there. He simply says this, God is love. Last week, if you remember, we looked at a similar statement where it said, God is light. And I said that statement expresses God's moral excellence and his inability to sin or even to come close to sin. You know what? It's got to be noted that John was very intentional in both of these statements to make sure that they could not be taken metaphorically, okay? He's not saying God is like a light or God is like love. John is saying without qualification here that God defines both of these terms. God is light. God is love. And in a world that asks questions such as, what is love? Or if we ever ask ourselves, am I loved? We can substitute all kinds of things for love. But what it comes down to is God himself is the definition of real love. Now I know some of you are a little more concrete in your thinking and in your terms. And when you, when you do a problem you want to prove your work. And so John I think gives us some glimpses today that I want to look at. That helps us better understand what does it mean that God is love. I think God is love because first of all. He's the one who took the initiative with Jesus. You know, when it comes to love, I think there's something to be said for being the one who takes the initiative. Sharon and I used to play this little game when we were younger in our marriage that if one of us would say, I love you, and the other person would say right back, well, I love you too, we would say, oh, that doesn't count because you just said that because I said it. And it was a silly little thing, but I think what both of us were trying to say is, I really love it when you take the initiative and just say those words to me without any prompting, without any coercion. I love you. At least to me, it seems more genuine when someone initiates that without us having ever done anything to make them say it. And when it comes to God's love for us, not only did he say he loved us first, but he showed us the extent of that, long, of that love long before we ever even drew our first breath. In fact, that's a point that John makes, I think, in 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. Look at those verses with me this morning. 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. John says this. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. If that sounds very familiar, it's because the apostle Paul wrote almost the same thing in Romans chapter 5 when he said, you see at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Isn't it amazing that God didn't wait for us to do anything before he was willing to say how much he loved us? He initiated that phrase. He even showed us how much he loved us because he allowed Jesus to die this very horrendous death on a cross so that we wouldn't have to. If you're ever having a down day, okay, if you're ever having one of those days where you're walking around saying, woe is me, nobody loves me, you know, it's an Eeyore type day, then could you please remember that verse that's probably the first verse that you learned from the Bible? 
that comes out of John chapter 3, verse 16 that says, God loved us so much that he sent his only son to die for us? And if you can't remember that, then maybe the first song that you ever learned, the, ever ch the first church song that you may have ever learned that says, Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. What does the Bible say about Jesus' love? It says that he died for you. Why did he die? Because God initiated that just to show us how much he loves us. We were loved long before we knew it. But God didn't stop just with Jesus. The next way that I think he shows how he is love is that he adopted us into his family. You know, many of us were blessed with biological parents who not only brought us into this world, but were able to raise and nurture us into adulthood. But did you know that every year in the U.S. alone, 135,000 children are adopted because their birth parents either could not or did not want to take care of them? My heart goes out to those agencies and those people who try to match a child especially a baby with parents who are wanting to adopt i can't imagine how hard that is i've been trying to read a little bit lately about people who, who famous people maybe who were adopted and and how life turned out for them and maybe how life was different and you know what there's a lot of different stories out there some end in tragedy and others turn out pretty well for instance steve was a baby whose mom was a young Catholic college student back in the 50s who became involved with one of the grad students in one of the classes that she was taking. Her father, when he, he learned about this dating relationship, wasn't pleased at all. In fact, he even threatened to cut it off, to cut her off from the family if she did not end that relationship. But in time, the relationship continued, and she and this Muslim grad assistant became pregnant, and she decided that she didn't want to keep the baby, but she wanted to give it up for adoption. But one of the stipulations she put on it was that whoever adopted Steve had to make sure that he would attend college. It was after a miscarriage that Paul and Clara, neither of which had ever been to college and weren't very wealthy, sought to adopt a child. When Steve's birth mother found out that they were the ones that this agency had chosen to take care of her baby, she threatened to sue the agency because she didn't trust that they would be the right ones. But they pledged they would do whatever it would take, okay, to make sure that he would go to college and receive the education as best he could. So she allowed him to be adopted. And then a couple of years later, they were even able to adopt his older sister. Paul, the adoptive father, liked to work on cars. And he really tried to get Steve interested in helping him, but he, he really showed very little interest. Steve was brilliant. They could tell that from a very early age. And he had a really hard time getting along with other students in school. In fact, he was bullied in some of the schools that he was in. In fact, in high school, he had a lot of difficulty. And so um, Paul and Clara decided they would sell their home and buy a home in a more upscale neighborhood that they really couldn't afford, but just so that they could keep their promise of him going to school and getting the best, best education possible. It was in this high school that he met another, he met a friend named Steve who was about three or four years older than him, but they shared a common interest in that being electronics. Together they forged a, friend, a friendship that would see great success in life as well as a lot of challenges. God only knows what would have happened to, Paul, to Steve had Paul and Clara Jobs not adopted Steve and did whatever it took for him to be able to attend one year of college. You should see he dropped out halfway through that first year. But it was Steve who revolutionized the whole world of personal computers, personal phones, and even the entertainment business. As you see, Steve Jobs helped start Apple Computer that makes Macs and iPads and iWatches and all of those things, as well as started Pixar, the company that was created to make Toy Story. If you read his biography, you'll, you'll see and you'll hear Steve talk about how much he felt loved by his adoptive parents. 
But you know, as much love as he received, it's not near as great as the love that we receive when we're adopted by God. In fact, listen to these words out of the start of chapter 3 in John's letter. Verse 1, he says, How great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called, that we should be made children of God. And that's what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. Look at those two words the NIV translates how great at the beginning of that verse. It's a very interesting single word there. If you do a little bit dig, of digging on it, what you'll find is that it's only used seven times in the New Testament, but each time that it's used, it has this idea of complete astonishment. How great. In fact, it's a love that was so great that we can't even wrap our minds around it, is what John's getting at here. In fact, the original meaning of this adjective is of what country? Of what country did this thought or idea come from? My buddy John Stott, again, wrote it this way. He says, the Father's love is so unearthly, so foreign to this world, that the Apostle John is wondering for what country it may have come from. Again, God's love when he adopts us is so great. And Paul, again, talks in his letter to the Romans a very similar theme in Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. He says, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Have you ever been to an adoption ceremony of someone where they're adopting a child into their world? I went to one not too long ago where uh, my friends were adopting their fourth child. Okay, they had four biological children. They were adopting the fourth child. They had three older brothers and now they were adopting the little girl. And I remember that the judge called on my friends and she made them swear that this child, as an adopted child of theirs, would receive all of the rights and all of the privileges as their own biological children, as well as the other four or other three adopted children. You know, the great part about being adopted by God is that we inherit not just eternal life that happens in the future, we, have, we, we inherit eternal life that starts now. And we're going to talk about that more next week. But the greatest thing about being adopted into God's family is that we don't come in at some inferior level. Paul says that we come in as a co-heir with Jesus himself. That is a great amount of love. So if there are times when we ever question whether or not there's anybody who loves us, I hope and pray that we'll remember whose family we're, all part, we're a part of. Most of us probably come from families who, who show us how much they love us. But you know what? God loves us so much more than that. Infinitely more than what our own families can love us for. And then having been adopted into God's family, there's a third and final way that I think God shows us how he is love. And that is that he enables us to love one another. You see, once we become his children, then he gives inside of us this ability to love others. We all know people who are harder to love than others, don't we? <laughs> Could you imagine how hard it would be if we had to love people on our own that are hard to love? Loving one another is this theme that John just repeats over and over and over again in 1 John. And I'm going to read some of them today, but I want to read them with the idea and ask you to listen to them of how is it that God gives us this ability to love others because of his love for us. We're going to start in 1 John chapter 3, verse 11, where John said this, 
This is the message you've heard from the beginning, okay? From the beginning of Jesus' ministry. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother Abel. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. This is how we know what love is, John says. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with action. And in truth, this then is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. And then let's go to 1 John chapter 4, pick up in verse 7. Similar theme again, John says, dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Love comes from God, gives us the ability to do that. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Skip down to verse 11 because we've already looked at 9 and 10. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one's ever seen God, but if we love, someone, if we love one another, then God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. We know that we live in him and he, in, he is in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. And so we know and rely on the love of God that God has for us. Again, God is love. Whoever lives, whoever loves, lives in God and God in him. You know how when you look at your kids and they manifest certain traits and characteristics of yours, you cringe? <laughs> it's like, oh, why'd they have to get that one? But you know what? The greatest characteristic that shows that we are truly God's children and that we are loved by him is our ability to love others. John makes sure to let us know that it's not just saying to someone that I love you, it's responding and trying to help that need. He uses the phrase, it's action and truth. You know, South Fork Church has a long history of doing action and truth when it comes to loving people. Such things as the Angel Fund is used to help those who maybe need help with some exp expenses or maybe some other ex essentials in life. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen and even experienced in my own life the outpouring of, of love when someone dies in a family and somebody's just overwhelmed with food and help and whatever we can to help. There's just, those are just a couple of ways that come to my mind about how great this church is at loving one another. During my years in ministry, I've been really blessed to be able to be involved in some different projects and initiatives that have really tried to help people experience God's love. Some of them were close by and some of them were halfway around the world. I think my favorite project that I've worked on was one in the Turkana region of Kenya, Africa. It was a partnership that we had at Hope Church with an organization called Bright Hope International. You've probably never heard of Turkana before, but, but it's one of the poorest sections in all of Africa. And it's only becoming worse because of the drought that has lasted for almost a decade. It's pretty much a desert, but now it's turning into a wasteland and millions of people are experiencing not just food insecurities, but are barely surviving. A couple of us were challenged by Bright Hope to go over and to see firsthand what it was. And the pictures that you're looking at now on the screen, uh, the one of the, the landscape just doesn't even do justice, okay, of how barren and how desolate and how dry it really is. The guy on the right there, or the guy on the, the, uh, standing beside me in the picture, his name is Bishop Francis. He's the one who's in charge of the, all of the local churches in the Turkana region for the uh, Pentecostal churches that are partnering with um, Bright Hope International. And he took me to places that were so desolate, places that I don't, I, I've never been any place like that in my life. 
In fact, the roads, quote unquote, that we had to drive on for four hours to get from the village of Lodwar, where we landed in a plane, to Natut, this village that we were looking at to help, they weren't roads. Four-wheel vehicles that you see in these pictures struggled and even got hung up on some of these roads trying to get through. And oh, did I mention as well that the sand is so hot there that if you stand in one place too long, your sneakers will ultimately melt because it's that hot? Amidst these conditions, though, there are people who are living and trying to survive. And you know what? When I saw this, my heart started to break for the need that was there. When we came back to the States, a plan was put together where a borehole could be drilled. A borehole is basically a well. That's going to be located on five acres of property outside of the town of Natute that they had secured where they were going to put together this little farm community. Five acres with drip irrigation where they could feed 50 families. I was really skeptical at first to think, could this really happen? Could this really transform this community? But you know what? When I came back and the guys who were with me, we started talking and it was like, we can't say we love our brothers in Christ in Africa and see this need and not do something to help them. And so with God's grace, we were able to put together the funding to do the borehole. And that trip that we first made was in February of 2017 where we saw that need. And in the summer of 2018, in July of 2018, a couple of us went back for the dedication of this well. And we drank water, some of the best water I've ever drank that came from that soil. Today, there's a farming village on that five acres where 50 families are farming that land. And the irrigation is providing not just food for their families, but they have extra food that they can take to the market and they can sell to other people so that they can have food as well. And then the money that they make, they give back, part of the money they make, they give back to the project so it can just continue to grow. I look forward to the day when I can go back and see the whole thing in action because we were challenged to not only say we love someone, but to do something to help them. It was one of those times where, you know, as a pastor, I was challenged. I preached First John before. I've said, you know, how much we need to love. But basically, I felt God was saying, hey, it's time that you put your faith and your truth into action. I hope to go back someday, and I want to take some of you with me. Because I want you to see what God can do when people are willing to put into action the love that God puts inside of them. South Fork has been a church that for decades has supported mission organizations that share the gospel message all around the world and who help in other ways. But in the near future, I hope that we as a church can find a project, whether it be local or whether it be around the world someplace, where we can show somebody how much we love them by helping them meet a need for water, for food, for education, something that we can do to help them. Why? Because God is love. And we could, stop, we could talk about that statement alone for weeks. But my goal today and my hope today is that you know God loves you. Whoever you are, whoever listens to this, I hope you know that God loves you and that you feel that love. So on this Valentine's Day, if you're feeling isolated because of the pandemic or because you're alone, know that God loves you. He showed you that with the extent of his love when he initiated sending Jesus to the earth to die for you. He adopted you to be one of his kids so that you could have all the same rights and privileges as any of his children. And you know what? When you're willing to show that love to someone else, 
Could you remember that it's God who's enabling you to do that? No one should feel unloved. Whether it be today or any day of the year. Because you know what? If we're willing to read 1 John, John makes it very clear that we can be confident in God's love. Let's pray. Father, I imagine that most people who listen and see this message today know that God loves them. They know that you are their father. They know that you have done all of these things for them. And yet, God, strange things happen in today's world. Doubt creeps into our mind and we begin to question whether or not we really are loved by you or anyone else. And so today my heart goes out and my prayers go up to you for those who may be struggling with that knowledge and that feeling. Father, may your spirit give them the ability to see your love. And Father, may that love then be transformative in their lives. God, you loved us. Father, today we want to say we love you as well. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.